Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're coming to the end of our Torah, and I was just mentioning to our congregation here, seeing the Torah coming to an end, it's a very humbling thing. It's it kind of sad, it's kind of exciting all at the same time that we made it through another year, um, or we're getting there, and we get to start again. Um, but you know, I like to savor things to the very end, amen, and enjoy them until we get to the very end. So all of you who are joining us, I pray the same is true for you. And before we do, let's, we're going to go ahead and say the blessing before we read from the Torah. Mbarehu et Adonai amevorach. Baruch Adonai Mevorak Leolam Vayed Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bekar Banu Mikol HaAmim Venetan Lano Etorato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Bless Adonai who is blessed. Blessed is Adonai who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Today's portion, Kitavo, can be found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verse 1, Devarim 26, 1. And we're going to go ahead and read a few verses of it here in Hebrew and then we will read in English as well. It says in the Hebrew, Vechaya kitavo el haaretz, asher Adonai elochecha, noten lecha, nachala, virishta, ve, veya shavta ba. Vela kachta mereshit, kol peri. Adama, Asher Tavi, Ha, How's there? Okay. Let me find my spot here. Where do I leave off here? Yeah. Vela Vela Kakta Mereshit Kol Peri Ha Adama Asher Tavi Me Artsecha Asher Adonai Elohecha Noten Lach Vesabta Vesamta Vatene Vehalakta El Hamakom Asher Ivar Adonai Elohecha Lesha Ken Shmo Sham Uvata El Hakohen Asher Vihye Bayamim Hahem Ve Armata Elav Hi Gadeti Hayom La Adonai Elohecha Kiva Kivati El Haaretz Asher Nishba Adonai La Avotenu Letet Latet Lanu Deuteronomy 26, 1. When you have come to the land Adonai your God is giving you as your inheritance, taken possession of it and settled there, you are to take the first fruits of all the crops, the ground yields, which you will harvest from your land that Adonai your God is giving you. Put them in a basket and go to the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. You will approach the Kohen holding office at the time and say to him, Today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land Adonai swore to our ancestors that he would give us. The Kohen will take the basket from your hand and put it down in front of the altar of Adonai your God. Then in the presence of Adonai your God you are to say, 
My ancestor was a nomad from Aram. He went down into Egypt, few in number, and stayed. There he became great, strong, popu and populous nation. But the Egyptians treated us badly. They oppressed us and imposed harsh slavery on us. So we cried out to Adonai, the god of our ancestors. Adonai heard us and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. And Adonai brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and a stretched out arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. Now he has brought us to this place and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Therefore, as you see, I have now brought the first fruits of the land which you, Adonai, have given me. You are then to put the basket down before Adonai your God, prostrate yourself before Adonai your God, and take joy in all the good that Adonai your God has given you, your household, the Levi, and the foreigner living with you. After you have separated a tenth of the crops yielded in the third year, the year of separating a tenth, and have given it to the Levi, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, so that they can have enough food to satisfy them while staying with you. You are to say in the presence of Adonai your God, I have rid my house of the things set aside for God and given them to the Levi, the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow, in keeping with every one of the mitzvot you gave me. I haven't disobeyed any of your mitzvot or forgotten them. I haven't eaten any of this food when morning. I haven't put any of it aside when unclean, nor have I given any of it for the dead. I have listened to what Adonai my God has said, and I have done everything you ordered me to do. And now the closing blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam let me restart that. I've got the wrong. But someone. Thank you. Baruch atah Adon. That's. <laughs> what a day. I'm just going to read it today. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher netan lanu Torah emet vehayeh olam netan betochenu Baruch atah Adonai no ten ha Torah Amen Blessed are you Adonai our God King of the universe You have given us a Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life Blessed are you Adonai giver of the Torah Amen and Amen You may be seated Today's portion comes from, again, Deuteronomy 26.1. And in the title of the, um, it, or not the title, but the, in each Bible it has a little, um, just before each section, it'll have like a little caption that'll say what it's about. And in most, I think the King James, it says probably offerings of first fruits uh, or first fruits and tithes or something to that effect. And we want to talk to you a little bit about this today. In verse number two, it says, You were to take the first fruits to Bikarim, all the crops of the ground uh, the ground yields, which you will harvest from your land that Adonai your God has given you. you. Put them in a basket and go to the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. It's very interesting here. What's missing from here that's usually associated with first fruits? Anybody? That's usually associated with first fruits. Passover. So we see that in um, some of the body where they, they associate Passover with first fruits. But we recognize it's two different things. This here, it's the Bikurim, which is associated with Shavuot, Pentecost. But in Hebrew... Uh, the words that are used for first fruits, there's two different words, and they're both translated as first fruits in English, so there's a lot of confusion um, over what they mean. But this isn't a connection to Passover, it's a connection to Shavuot, to the, the, the grain harvest. 
And it says here that Adonai, where are they going to take this to? To the place Adonai chose to have his name live. But doesn't God live everywhere? Doesn't his name live everywhere? If you're on the dark side of the moon, marooned on a ship, would the Father be there with you? Yes. But there's a special place where he lives, where he, his, where he abides, where he is with his people. Amen? Well, isn't Shabbat a day like the six days of the week? Yeah, but it's something special uh, that Shabbat is. Amen? Yeah. So where is this place that I chose to have his name live? Jerusalem. And where specifically in Jerusalem? The temple. And where specifically did he put the temple? On Mount Moriah. Or in Hebrew, Mount Moriah, the mountain of the teacher. And what is that place called through scripture? Hamakom, the place. You see it over and over and over. I will send you to the place. Where did Jacob lay down his head? And he laid down his head at the place. What was the threshing floor that was purchased from the Jebusites? The place. So we see this idea of there are some things that are very, very specific. A lot of things are general. But it's a wonderful thing to understand the things that are very, very specific and unique. And it says here, he tells the Israelites to take this fruit um, to the place that he shall choose. And a few things that are interesting to note, that the Israelites, they weren't under any obligation to bring the first fruits, thank you, until they had conquered the land and divided it. But when they did, they knew where they were, they were to take it. You can read about that in Kedeshim 37b. Um, but I want to get to a couple of things here about the first fruits. Um, let me read something to you here. Then thou shalt take of the first of all the fruits of the ground, of the first fruits, but not all the fruits, or not all of the first fruits, for not all fruits are subject to the duty of bringing to the temple their first fruits. Only the seven chief kinds of products of Israel alone for their, that are mentioned in the land. Deuteronomy 8.8, 8, it says the land of wheat and barley, etc., suggesting that these are two of them that need to be taken in. So what are the rest of them? Anybody remember the other seven? Or the other five, excuse me? So wheat, barley, pomegranates, figs, dates, grapes, olives, that's it. And I want to give you what, just a brief little synopsis of what they all represent. The wheat corresponds and represents kindness, chesed. It's the, um, well, certain things I don't want to get into, but it represents kindness. The barley represents or corresponds to gevurah or restraint. The grapes grow in beautiful clusters and correspond to teferet, beauty. The figs correspond to netzach, endurance. The pomegranates, a very beautiful and majestic fruit. It even has a crown, and it corresponds to hod, which means majesty and glory. Beautiful, huh? And hod is also related to the Hebrew word todah, which means thanks, recognition. We recognize the king the king even has a crown on his fruit. I mean, what don't you get this whole idea? Olives represent yesod, foundation. Since olive oil is the foundation of most Mediterranean foods, Maimonides explains that olive oil cleanses the liver and loosens stools. Drinking a teaspoon of olive oil every morning before eating can help prevent stones in the urinary tract. Olive oil protects against heart disease by lowering blood pressure. It has strong antibacterial properties. It also contains several antioxidants to help fight cancer. 
Thus, olive oil, olive oil can truly be called the foundation, the yesod of life. Just, uh, wow. And then dates correspond to Malhut, or the kingdom. Malhut, the kingdom, is a channel that allows everything to manifest below. Therefore, Malhut is connected with a digestive system. The Talmud teaches that dates heal intestinal uh, illnesses. I, I love this part. Malhut is the channel or the way or the mechanism or the vehicle that allows everything to exist here. Without the kingdom of God, nothing exists here. Nothing even matters here. I was listening to a teaching this week, and the rabbi was talking about this idea um, within Judaism that says, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, don't talk too much. It's like people who talk a lot. Typically, what you, when you hear people who talk a lot, usually what they're talking about has nothing to do with anything. It's just a bunch of nothingness. Vanity. Just in a lot of ways, just a waste of breath. Think about that. Think about the people who you can really talk about deep things of the kingdom with. He was even talking about this idea that, you know, in Western civilization, you know, if you're sitting with people at a table and there's silence, then someone feels compelled to have to say something. Or it feels awkward. But in the kingdom, it's okay to be silent. Rabbi Bernstein brought up the Beatles. I think it was the Beatles. The song, the, the, song, the sounds of silence. <laughs> See? Thank you. I appreciate that. The Beatles was just before my time. So was Simon and Garfunkel. Although I'm actually a little more familiar with them because they did some songs that were on cartoons growing up. Um, but that being said, you know, we live up in the mountains and where we live, we can hear a car, you know, a lot of times a mile or more away because we live in a little valley area and it echoes and everything. We can hear somebody playing their music. It's like, you know, we moved up here to be away from that city um, industrial noise. We want to hear the sounds of, the sounds of the birds and the squirrels, and all of these things. But there's a big difference you can hear when everything is peaceful and wonderful, and then you hear something that comes in that disturbs that. You recognize it really quick when you're in tune to the sounds of silence, when you're tuned in to the sounds of Hashem, the sounds of the kingdom, if you will. Amen? In Deuteronomy 26.3, the children of Israel, they were called to uh, bring in this bikurim, and it says here, 26.3, you will approach the Kohen holding office at the time and say to him, today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land. Adonai swore to our ancestors that he would give us. And it says the Kohen will take the basket from your hand and put it in front of the altar of Adonai your God. And verse 26, then in the presence of Adonai, your God, you are to say, or actually before I get there, let's talk about this. This is once again another opportunity to show you what Torah says and then how Israel practices it, how it's, how's it done. Another great example here. Concerning and thou shall go unto the priest that shall be in those days. There's always duty priests and priests run duty to do a specific task. Many of them doing a lot of specific things. Um, but it's interesting to note what Rashi had to say about this. It says, and thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days. And that's referring to verse number. Yeah, 26.3. You will approach the Kohen holding office at the time and say to him, Today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land. Adonai swore to our ancestors that he would give us. The Kohen will take the basket from your hand and put it down in front of the altar 
of Adonai, your God. In the Hebrew, there's this idea and understanding that it sounds like it's redundant. And the idea behind it is, it sounds like, what is he saying? Is he coming to the priest? Is he coming to God? Is he coming to the priest? Is he coming to the priest and to God? What exactly is actually played out here? These in Hebrew, the, I don't have it here in front of me. I, this morning, something interesting happened. I printed a few things out, and when I went to print the rest of hit print the rest of what I had out, the electricity went out. So we had no electricity this morning. <laughs> so I'm realizing that something didn't actually print out. What's that? Oh, that's why my hair is messed up. Is that what you said? Oh, I didn't think anyone would notice. <laughs> but this idea that Rashi was talking about is the only priest at the time you need to be concerned about is the one who's there in front of you who you're bringing this offering to and presenting it with. Um, and the part where it says, I profess this day, the expression this day implies that the declaration is made one uh once a year, one day a year, but not twice a year. Even when you bring um, a different bickerim. So what does that mean? You may bring in your wheat or your barley, and you'd say this, I have um, made this trip. I have done what I've been called to do with the bickerim. And you may come back a handful of times again, because maybe later on you have... Um, there's dates and there's figs and pomegranates. Maybe you had a lot of these different things. You come back, so in effect, you wouldn't say the same thing again because you've already made the declaration uh, that one time. And so people would come, and it's, I, I love this, how Israel works. There was a process by which you would um, look at your crops, and when you would see the smallest little bud or whatever it is coming up, you would take a, something uh, like a natural fiber, like a, a stalk of wheat, and you grab and you tie around it to mark. That's the bikurim. That's the, the first of the crop that's coming up. And again, this is connected to Shavuot, not to Passover. Um, people say, well, Yeshua, he was the first fruit of among many brethren. Well, was he the first? You know, he rose from the dead symbolically and everyone else who is going to rise again, have redemption. So symbolically, yes. But this idea, the first fruits, is not um, after uh, the day after Passover. That's the counting of the Omer. The Omer starts and the Omer ends with when? With, what's that? Shavuot, with the time when the Bikarin, the first fruits were actually brought into the temple. Um, but this idea of in a basket, How many of you know, you could tell me, you could go out right now and get a basket that would be the appropriate size for this? How would you know? See, this is why when the, the, the Talmud was written, the different writings of the rabbis, it was because they discussed, we've been given the task of doing this, how do we do it? So if you read in the writings of the rabbis, the basket was small, it was just a small basket, enough to... Bring in the bikurim. And this isn't tithes. This isn't a tithe. This isn't an offering. Those are two different things that are, um, have different um, methods and ways of doing. This is a totally different. This is a small little offering. And the significance of this, what do you think the significance of this is? What is part of the vow that the person would say as they go and they're bringing this to the priest? They're saying, I have kept the command in effect to put you first. That the first fruit that comes off of this, I have brought to you. I haven't set it aside for me. I haven't set it aside for someone else. I haven't taken it and hidden it and promised to bring it in. Not. It was a very specific offering, a very uh, specific mitzvah to bring in the bikurim to the temple I'm in. And you would have whole communities bringing their bikurim in together. 
and they would start at night, and they would bring it in. They would go through the night. They would, if need to, to make it to it to Jerusalem to the temple. People were festive. They would look and say, "Oh wow, look! The produce from your farm has made it to offer to Hashem here at the temple." And there was a continuous flow of the bikurim coming these little baskets at a time, all the way from Shavuot to Sukkot, and then it was even extended all the way to Hanukkah because there were fruits that were still coming up. So there was this constant parade of people's thanksgiving and commitment to Hashem to bring them the first. What, a, what an idea of how much you actually love God that you would do that. Because there's a temptation for you to eat the first you know, pomegranate of the year. Look, the first pomegranate of the year is right here. And everyone sees it. No, it's already tied. It's already marked for Hashem. Amen? In verse 26, 5, it says, Then in the presence of Adonai, your God, you are to say, My ancestor was a nomad from Aram. He went down to Egypt, few in number, and stayed. Then he became a great, strong, and populous nation. So who, what are they talking about here? Any thoughts? Very interesting. This is according to Rashi. It says, A Syrian destroyed my father. He mentions the loving kindness of the omnipresent of Hashem, saying, Arami of Eravi. A Syrian destroyed my father, which means Levan, Laban, wished to exterminate the whole nation when he pursued Jacob. Because he intended to do it, Hashem accounted it to him as though he had already done it, and therefore expre the expression Oved, which refers to the past, is used. For as far as the nations of the world are concerned, the Holy One, blessed be he, accounts unto them intention as an actual deed. I heard someone say, and I was very surprised to hear this. I had never heard someone say this before. This was actually someone who was Jewish. And they said that um, they characterized, um, I'm trying to remember the, the particular context of it, but the Jews are, are follow the Torah um, as it relates to actually doing something is the problem where, you know, within Christianity, there's the idea of, if you even think about it, like Yeshua said, then you've done it. And I thought, no, 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 no. I wanted to, I was almost knocking on the screen of the TV. And I said, no, that's not right. You know, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of things from outside of Judaism have gone into Judaism. And some Jews actually believe and teach that. But that's not what has always been understood in Judaism. Rashi can tell you right then um, what it meant. That the, bless, the Holy One, blessed be, he accounts unto them intention as an actual deed. Saying the exact same thing that Yeshua said. If a man shall look upon a woman and think. Yeshua said that. When Yeshua said it, he wasn't saying anything that wasn't understood or that they'd never heard before, there was no understanding about. This was Judaism 101. When he says this, or when he said that. So if you intend to do evil, it's accounted as though you have already done it. And it's interesting because we're in this time of Teshuvah. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Wasn't, wasn't he saying that? Um, wasn't he saying that Hashem is 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 for actually, from, from Christian friends, there's this teaching of, um, what do they call it, the fence, not the fence laws, but building a fence. Or, um, it's true, but the way I've heard it all the time is this idea, it, it, what I've heard from the from a Christian side, it has a negative, it always comes with a negative connotation that... Um, they were adding to Torah by telling you to, you know, um, you know, if there's a fire there and you don't want to fall into it, then build a fence around it. Well, if the fence gets hot, then you're touching the fence, you can burn and build another fence. There's a side that's always been taught that they were adding to God's word is what I'm getting at. 
by building a fence, that was the instruction of man, not the instruction of God. No, because um, what's well known within Torah too, in Perky Avot, is that um, it says to build a fence around the Torah. But it has nothing to do with man doing something that God didn't say or it's man-made or it's... No, that's the idea. You love God so much, so much that you're staying further and further and further away, not with the idea that you're adding to something that God did that was incomplete and you think that you know more so you can go ahead and add to it. That's how I've always heard it. So the idea of building a fence around the Torah, absolutely. You know, I heard Rabbi talk to someone, a situation, you know... You, get into a situation where somebody has a problem and he'll say, build a higher fence. You need a higher fence around the Torah because apparently you're still getting over that fence. So there's, um, so yeah, so when they did that, I'm, I'm getting at this, they did it with full, in, full instruction and connection with Hashem doing it. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. So it's kind of like, like the protection yeah. the individual. And the community. Yeah. Yeah. Where this is hard to obey the Torah. Yeah. Then you put the fence around it to keep you from from going to that place that your nature mm-hmm. values you. Yes, and it ha- and it's not a case of you adding to Torah, mm-hmm. or you're adding to the Word of God or not. You know, I give you a for instance. This is something. There's always you know things that within from Judaism to Messianic Judaism, to Christianity, there is all these different issues that come up and there's different observations of way, or, way of handling things. You know, I remember in the, um, our days in the church, a lot of the European uh, churches, they didn't have any problem with alcohol at all. They, re- they saw for what it was, what, you know, Yeshua made wine. I mean, it's, wine is a symbol of joy, all these things. There's some in the American church that are very, um, they just don't want their people drinking. Okay. I, I can understand why, because of the problems and everything. So there's this idea, well, God says something is good, but maybe too much of that good is bad, right? So then the idea is, we'll build a fence around it. Build a fence around that which is causing you to stumble, but that may not cause someone else to stumble. So don't go around building fences for them. You worry about the fence that he's called you to do. Um, and we're going to get into judging. That's going to come up here in the, the Brit Shah portion, which is it's very interesting things that, um, that are said within Judaism concerning that. Um, but that being said, what, how am I looking time-wise? I'm at three. I'm not going to read anymore. I'm just going to, I had some things I wanted to go to, but for time's sake, we're going to go ahead and stop right here. But I want to say in the season of Elul, may we all return our hearts to Hashem, doing the mitzvah to hasten the return of Messiah. Because we have a part to play. Doesn't matter if it's one person. Doesn't matter if it's 10 or 100. We have a part to play. And as a matter of fact, the fewer of us there are in either this community or the combination of communities, that means we have even a bigger part to play. Because there's less of us to do the work even. So Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We'll see you in a little bit. So let's